Today we're in a series uh, that is called Your Own Worst Enemy, and this has been a hard series, and we're actually going to continue this series to about Memorial Day weekend because I feel like I'm just drinking from a fire hydrant, um, if that makes sense. I'm just like, oh, um, I just, there's like so much I want to say, and there's so much work I need to do on me when it comes to this series. So I'm like, okay, we're done, and God's like, oh, no, no, we're not. You know, and he's like, there's a couple more things. So um, we're going to be talking through this series through the end of May. And today I want to talk to you about crashed boats and duct tape. Crashed boats and duct tape. Um, I had a different title ready for today that was going to be phenomenal. But as I was checking my illustration, that illustration wasn't true. That story wasn't true. So there's no fake news happening up here. Okay, just so you know. Um, I'm fact checking what I say and what I speak. So um, crash boats and duct tape is my title. It was gonna be duct tape bikinis and meth using deer, but that did not work out. So um, (laughs) dadgummit. So crash boats, when I was in college, um, one of my buddies, he talked his dad into letting him take his boat to college. Um, And this was phenomenal because we all had morning classes. So by the time lunch hit, We were done with school. And can we just all agree college is way better than high school? Um, For all the high school graduates, I'm just going to tell you I loved college because it wasn't all day at school. So um, me and my buddies, we took all morning classes, so we had all afternoon to go play. And Shad, my buddy, talked his dad into letting us bring his dad's boat to Waxahachie, Texas, um, to be able to go on this nasty, nasty lake in Waxahachie. Um, And so we're out there, we're going, this several times we've been out. Um, I am actually water skiing, it's before wakeboards were out, so just so you know, that's how old I am, how old are you? Um, And so we're water skiing and Chad goes, hey man, um, can can you drive the boat? I want a kneeboard. And I'm like, absolutely. He's like, do you know how to drive a boat? I'm like, duh, yeah, I know how to drive a boat. I had no idea how to drive a boat, right? Um, But I wasn't gonna admit that. (laughs) So I'm like, yeah, Shad, I can drive the boat. So I get in there, I start driving the boat. Problem is I had lost my contacts while I was water skiing. Um, I had just blinked too hard and both of them popped out, right? So I, and if I don't have my contacts, I'm blind as a bat. Anybody else there with me? Yes, yes, you don't have your glasses or contacts. You can't see anything, right? I can see it right here. Um, So we're going around, but I'm like, how hard can it be? You just hit the throttle and you keep the boat in the middle of the lake, right? Not hard, not difficult. Problem was that you didn't know that I forgot about there was a sandbar in the middle of the lake. You know what happened before I'm even getting to the end of the story. You know exactly. So we're going along, Shad's an e-board and blah, 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 blah. He starts yelling something and I'm thinking he's staying faster, right? Because I can't see the sandbar that we're heading towards. I'm like, okay, and I go faster. And he's like, no, and we, I mean, we just come to a halt. Like that, and Shad starts cussing me out up and down, and, and rightfully so, right? He's like, you, Shad, you knew how to drive a boat. There's a sandbar. I'm like, Shad, I can't see anything. So um, I just throttled it more because I thought that would help, and that's not what you're supposed to do if you're in a boat. I didn't know if you knew that. Um, and so I bent the prop all up, which is not good. Um, we actually had to have another boat come and pull us out. Not a tugboat, but just a boat, because I mean, we were stuck, right? Um, and so that ended our boating season and his dad never let us take his boat back to Waxahachie, Texas. It stayed down in the greater Houston area. And, and, and here's the, deep, the reason I'm telling you this story. Why did this happen? Why did Justin Graves crash Shad Davidson's boat? It's because... I didn't want to admit I needed help, right? It's because I didn't want to be instructed on something I thought I should know. And because I didn't want to receive instruction and because I didn't want to be mansplained something, right? I became my worst enemy because I started faking it till I made it, right? I'm just gonna fake it till I make it. And that is not just a horrible strategy to drive a boat with, That's a horrible strategy for you and I to live life with, to fake it till we make it. Can I just be honest? That is a horrible, horrible strategy for you and I to live with. And so today I wanna talk to you about your willingness to receive correction. Oh, this is gonna be so fun today. 
may be the most quiet message right after tithing that I preach all year. How are you at receiving correction? Graduates, high school graduates, your life, your journey is going to be full of needing correction. It's true. Um, when, when you get into your 20s, you're still gonna need correction. When you get in your 30s, you're gonna still need correction. When you get married, you're gonna still need correction. When you're successful at your job, you're gonna still need correction. When you're at the top, on the top of the mountain of your career, of your family, you're hitting six figures, life's going, you're still going to need correction. Because when you and I don't receive correction, here's what I will tell you, we become our own worst enemy. We become our own worst enemy. And I deal with so many adults I encounter so many marriages, I encounter so many college students, so many young professionals that are single, that their refusal to receive and accept correction, sometimes the Bible calls that a a, a gentle rebuke, right? To, To not receive correction or a rebuke when we're in the wrong because they can't receive it, it absolutely sidetracks their whole life and they get in their own way. And my hope and my goal from this message is that you and I, that we don't get in our own way and we don't become our own worst enemy. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 31 through 32 says this, if you listen to constructive criticism, you will be at home among the wise. But if you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. This proverb is your memory verse for the week, right? Write it down, put it on your mirror, put it on your car dash, Proverbs 15, 31 through 32, because this proverb has a huge promise, but also a massive warning to it, and it is contingent on the first three words, if you listen. If you listen to constructive criticism, and why would we not listen, because if we aren't careful, when we get corrected, we get mad. Be honest. When we get corrected, we get embarrassed. I, I should have known better, right? We get, our, we get our feelings hurt, and as a result, instead of being corrected, we get offended. And we choose offense over correction, and here's what I want us to know. It's our first point today. We become our own worst enemy when we choose offense over correction. We become our own worst enemy when we choose offense, when we choose not to listen, we are no longer among, we aren't home among the wise. Instead, we have become our own worst enemy and gotten in our own way because we are choosing offense over correction, your willingness to listen or refusal to listen and receive correction will either be a huge benefit for you or a massive detriment to you. And you and I, we have to learn something. We have to learn to listen to constructive criticism. You notice I didn't say criticism because there's a massive difference between criticism and constructive criticism constructive criticism. I can't even say it, right? There's a big difference between criticism and constructive criticism. So what is constructive criticism? Constructive criticism is correction that is for your benefit from people you know are for you and love you. Let me say that again. It is correction that is for your benefit that is from people you know. You know this. You may not feel it, There's a difference between feeling and knowing that you know are for you and you know they love you. And before you listen to criticism, you need to ask, do they love me? And do they want what's best for me? And does it contain truth? Right? Because if it contains those truths, if they love you, if they want what's best for you, and it contains truth, whether this is your parent correcting you, parents, whoo, I'm coming after you. All you older parents that have grown children, does it contain truth? You know they're for you, you know they love you. And can I tell you, sometimes the hardest person to bring correction to is your grown adult parent. 
And are you going to listen, grown parent? You're like, wait a second, this is your time to pick on the graduates. Are you going to listen to constructive criticism? Because if you listen, you will be home among the wise. But your refusal to listen to constructive criticism makes you and I our own worst enemy. So the question is, are you gonna choose correction or offense? Now, I love the Greek definition of offense. It means to take the bait, to take the bait. And Satan is great at baiting us to take offense, isn't he? He, is, he knows exactly what he is doing. He's not stupid. He's not some devil running around with pointy ears and like, ugh, right? He's really smart about the way that he works and the way that he acts, and he knows how you think, he knows your tendencies, and he knows how to bait you in such a way that you take offense instead of correction almost every time. And, and, and if you know, if you know, the people that are bringing correction to you that it is constructive criticism, then here's your job and my job. It's not to get upset. Right, why do we get offended? Because we get upset, but sometimes it comes from a place of insecurity. And we get embarrassed. Because while well, I should have known better, all of us should have. Right, well, well but, but I, I, I just, I feel so bad. Right, all of us feel bad when we're corrected. None of us like correction, but it is a needed place for our life. And if your correction is coming from a spouse, and spouses, you better be careful, baby. You better write, have the right words, the right tone. Don't you correct in a text. Don't be stupid. That's dumb. You're danger, 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 right? Like it's getting hot. Your phone's going to blow up. Like, you know, like when your phone shuts off because it gets too hot sitting in the sun, your marriage is getting too hot because you are trying to correct through text. Um, but are you allowing your spouse to bring correction? And are you making sure that you've got the right words, the right tone, and the right timing to it? Or do you get upset? Do you take the bait of offense? Because if that's the case, listen to me, because I want the best for you today. If that's the case, your marriage is gonna be dysfunctional forever. Because you're not able to receive correction and make course adjustments. Everybody in this place, raise your hand. Everybody, all right now, everybody raise your hand. Everybody, all of you that have raised your hand are admitting right now, whether you wanted to or not, you need correction. We all need correction, right? We all need correction. And, and teenagers and graduates, you are going to need, you're not gonna have it all figured out and you've got to figure out, oh, am I gonna take the bait of offense or am I gonna receive the godly constructive criticism that God has put in my path? I love what John Bevere said. He said, an offended heart is the breeding ground of deception. And you and I deceive ourselves so many times, and we start creating our own narrative, and we start coming up with our own truth when we get our feelings hurt and we take the bait of offense. Proverbs 19, 27 says this, if you stop listening to instruction, my child, you will turn your back on knowledge. So let me ask you this question. Do you have people who love you more than they love your feelings? Do you have people in your life that love you more than they love your feelings? That they're willing for you not to like them for a moment, right? That they're willing to be unpopular in your life for a moment if it means bringing wisdom and correction to your life. And if you have those people, your job and my job is to listen up and shut up, right? It's to listen up and to shut up. Because the alternative is this, is that we go our own way and we're like, why didn't anybody tell me? Well, people were telling you, but you didn't listen up and shut up to the people that really love you and were put and placed in your life and saw harm coming your way and they were bringing constructive criticism, but because you chose offense over correction, you just decided to go your own way. Um, I, I remember doing these all the time with Charlie and Chloe, index cards, right? And any time they would have a test, especially, especially if they were taking Spanish, um, I think Charlie took Greek, right? I'm like, well, how do I even say this word? Um, but my, my favorite were the state capitals, right? So we would go through, you know, I would be like, Missouri, what's the capital of Missouri? Does anybody know? 
Jefferson City, you are a freak. Um, I'm impressed. Anybody remember the capital of New Hampshire? Concord, man, whoa, she didn't have her phone out. That's what I'm talking about, teacher, come on. Man, and when we would go through these, and if Charlie didn't know the answer to the capital of New Hampshire, that it is Concord, she wouldn't go, you hate me, dad, right? Like, you hate me. That's not what the card says. You just keep changing the answers, don't you? Just so you're always right and I'm always wrong. No, she didn't do that. She didn't say, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. That's just your truth. No, that's what the freaking capital of New Hampshire is. Right? And can I tell you, your life and my life has to be full of flashcard moments with people that we're allowing them not to bring their opinion, but to bring the word of God into your life. And you don't get to say, well, that's not true for me. It doesn't matter if it's true for you or not. That's what the word of God says. And he's not changing his scripture to fit your lifestyle or to fit your opinion. This is what the Bible says. And you gotta make sure that you listen to that correction, that you have index moments in your heart because here's the alternative. If you decide not to live that way, if you decide not to choose correction over offense, here's the alternative in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. And it's a foolish way to live to think your own way is right all the time. To ignore the flashcard moments that God brings to your life to ignore those moments is a foolish way to live. But if you're gonna be wise, you're going to stop and you're going to listen to others so that you can make course corrections, so that you don't get in your own way and you don't become your own worst enemy. So the question is this, if we know this, if we know we should choose correction over offense, what makes us stop listening? Right, what, what comes into our life that brings this tendency of we begin to stop listening to others? And it's something that is so sneaky, it's a silent assassin that hits your life and my life and it creeps in and we don't even know it's there. It's our second point, it says this, humility receives correction and leads to honor, but pride chooses offense and leads to destruction. Humility receives correction, doesn't it? You gotta be humble to receive correction. And here's the promise of the humble, and if you humble yourself, that it will lead you to a place of an honorable life. But if you choose to live a life that is full of pride, that is puffed up, man, it refuses correction, it chooses offense, and it leads to destruction. Pride makes you your own worst enemy, and it comes in unknowingly and very, very silently. Uh, a, a few years ago, we had a, uh, something done to our house, some outside heaters put on our back patio that are fantastic, by the way. Um, and so while they come to put these uh, uh, heaters on our back patio, they had to run new electricity and they had to go up into our attic. And I've shared this before, but why would the electrician is up there, he goes up into our attic and he hears our air conditioning running and we had an air conditioning guy come out. Um, I will not say their name um, because this would ruin their company, but they cut one of the PVC pipes and didn't fix it. And as a result, it's just spewing out carbon monoxide in our attic. And the electrician's like, hey, 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 Yo, yo, come here. I don't even know your name, but come here. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, you see this pipe? That's carbon monoxide, and it's spewing that out in your attic, and you need to get an AC guy here now. And so I got on the phone right now, and he's like, you know what the crazy thing is? You had no idea that was there. It's a good thing that you did spray foam insulation because it probably saved your whole family's life, even though you have a carbon monoxide detector because you probably would have slept through it with all your box fans, right? Um, <laughs> He's like, this would have killed you and you wouldn't even have known it. And can I tell you, pride works the same way. You don't realize the effects of pride until it's too late. You don't realize you're a prideful person until it's too late. And there are telltale signs of that pride has gotten in your life. Let me give you a few effects of pride and how to tell if it's an issue. Pride makes you all knowing and never receiving. Right, it makes you, it puffs you up, but it's gonna bring you down. Pride makes you sensitive and easily offended because if you know it all, then why do you need correction and instruction? 
It makes you all-knowing and never receiving. Pride makes you dismissive of anything you don't agree with. It makes you dismissive of the index card moments in your life. Well, they don't know what they're talking about. Why, why should they? Why, who are they to correct me? Right? Look at your life. Your life's all messed up anyways, right? And it leads to our other thing. It compares. Well, I'm not as bad as them. When did, when did that start becoming the calling card of being a follower of Christ that, that oh, I'm, doing I'm not as bad as them? Right? That's not, that's not the measuring stick that you and I are called to live our life. We're called to live our life for, as God's will and purpose for our life, not comparing it to others. Well, I'm a little bit better than Jeremy Moore, right? Like, He's just sitting over there and was harassing me, right? Like, but, but I, you know, I'm doing a little bit better than Tiny over here. You know, Tiny's, Tiny's trying. He's doing better, but I'm doing a little bit better. Right? No, 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 no. And that becomes pride, and we just start dismissing others, and we start making things better in our life. But here's the thing about pride, and, and this is what I know, and this is what you know. Nobody loves a prideful person, but everybody loves a humble person. Really think about it. Everybody loves a humble person. Like, hey, thank you for te telling me that. Man, thanks for caring enough to tell me that. Not, well, that may be true for you, but you know, maybe you need to work on your own situation and your own shortcomings before you come and correct me. And the thing about offended people who are full of pride, here's the hard thing. They can't be told that they're prideful, that they're sensitive, and, they're th and that they are offendable. And some of you, you are here today and you're watching online right now, and that's you. And the question is, are you going to have a correcting moment right now? Are you going to have an index card moment right now where God and the Holy Spirit is trying to bring correction and say, man, listen up. And if you will listen, it will lead you to a better place where you will be home among the wise. Because here's the truth. It's a choice to be humble, and it's a choice to be prideful. Proverbs 29, 23 says, pride ends in humiliation while humility brings honor. Pride ends in humiliation while humility brings honor. So how do you become humble instead of prideful? You choose to be humble or you choose to be prideful. It's something you choose and decide. You choose to live a life offended or you choose to live life open to correction. It's something that you choose to ignore to ignore instruction is a choice and to listen to instruction is a choice. To assume the worst about a person correcting you is a choice. To give the benefit of the doubt to the person is a choice. To get better is a choice. To get worse is a choice. To live life with wisdom is a choice. To live life foolishly is a choice. To live life based on God's will and purpose is a choice. And to live life based on your feelings is also a choice. And there's this moment in the New Testament in, contained in Galatians chapter 2 where the Apostle Paul has just been accepted by the other apostles, the other disciples. And Paul, who just now got to be in the boys' club, right? This, I mean, it's just like, yeah, I'm part of the guys now. He sees the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Peter, the one that Jesus put in charge of the church, the guy that walked on water for a little bit, longer than you and I have, right? Even if you're trying to run on your pool, it doesn't work so far, um, right? Like, you do it. Um, but <laughs> the Apostle Peter that is leading the charge of the church and preach, and thousands of people have come to the church two times over this guy. That Apostle Peter, Paul sees the Apostle Peter interacting with the Gentiles when Jewish people aren't around, and he's all their buddy, 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 but when the Jewish people come around, he's like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And it says this in Galatians chapter two, but when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face for what he did was very wrong. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. And Paul confronts the apostle Peter. And Peter could have been like, bro, what? Weren't you just last month trying to kill us all, bro? Like, weren't you just a few years ago, like, trying to wipe us out? Weren't, who were you? Where were you when the whole starting of this church happened, right? Do you know who I am? Do you know my credentials? Did you walk with Jesus? Did you see the miracles of Jesus? Have you walked on water, right? Like, have you done all these things? 
And yet, the apostle Peter took the correction and he got better. And here's the news for you and me. No matter how mature you may think you are in Christ, you are never so mature that you don't need correction in Christ. No matter how mature, no matter how long you've been, if the apostle Peter needed correction, newsflash, you and I need correction. Because can I tell you, old age is not a guarantee of wisdom. Sometimes we just arrive at old age as a stubborn fool. So Proverbs 11:2, we're going to keep going. Says this, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. So how do we live with humility that receives correction and leads to honor? Number one is this, surround and give permission. Surround and give permission. How do you live a life of humility? Surround and give permission. Proverbs 19, 20, get all the advice and instruction you can so you will be wise the rest of your life. Can I tell you, you have to take responsibility for getting godly people in your life. Because bad company corrupts good character. It's just true. And it's your responsibility to find people you admire, that you love the way their life looks, and you surround yourself with, and I'm gonna say this again, godly, biblical people that can pour into your life. And you gotta get, you gotta get them. I have godly, biblical people Two of them are in this service that I'm like, hey man, I need you in my life. And if you see me getting a, a degree off, something off, man, let me know. Because I don't want to fumble this ball, the, the ball this late, this stage of the game, right? Like I, I don't want to be a casualty of ministry. I don't want to be a casualty of temptation. If you see something, man, bring correction to me. And my job is to not just give them in my life, but give them permission to speak in my life. Some of you, you've got people in your life, but you haven't given them permission to speak in your life. And what I know about wise people are wise people aren't going to give advice where they're not welcome. Right, And you've got to let those people off the leash to speak into your life. The second thing is this, is when you get those people, point two, listen and apply. Proverbs 9, so don't bother correcting mockers. They will only hate you, but correct the wise and they will love you. Instruct the wise and they will be even wiser. Teach the righteous and they will learn even more. You've got to listen and apply. What is listening? Listening isn't just hearing. Listening is hearing and doing. Some of us are great and nice about hearing correction, but you just go and do your own thing and ignore it. And here's what I can tell you. If you do that with people that you have surrounded your life with, and you say, hey, bring correction to my life, and you don't listen to their instruction and their wisdom and their biblical counsel, they're gonna stop giving it. I, I have met with people, they're like, oh, just, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do, man. This is where my life is. This is where my life is. I'm like, well, you got to stop doing this. You got to stop doing this, and you need to start doing this. And you know what they do? They keep doing this. They keep doing this, and they never did that. And you know what I stopped doing? I stopped meeting with them. I stopped meeting with them, and I started meeting with them, these people instead. Because I'm not going to waste my time and, and, and my energy on somebody who's not gonna listen to the biblical counsel they're asking me for in the first place. And man, you can surround yourself with wise biblical people, but if you're not applying what they're saying, man, that wisdom is going to waste and they're gonna stop listening to you and stop meeting with you because their time is valuable. So it's not just about knowing what to do, it's actually putting it in to practice. Man, it... If you don't put it into practice, can I tell you, you're being that guy. And you don't wanna be that guy, right? You don't wanna be your own worst enemy. You don't wanna get in your own way. And how do we not get in our own way? We don't just listen, but we listen and we apply. Third way that we become a humble person is that we own it and don't give up. We own it and we don't give up. To all my graduates, to all my college students, all my high school students, all my young professionals, can I tell you, pride makes you blame others for things instead of owning things yourself. Pride makes you refuse accountability and be responsible for things, and you and I are going to blow it at times. You and I, we're going to crash the boat into the sandbar every once in a while. You're not going to get all the right answers on the index cards of life. 
But Proverbs 10 says this, people who accept discipline are on the pathway to life, but those who ignore correction will go astray. And own that you messed up and stop blaming others because nobody's life got better by blaming others. Right, it's called accountability. It's called responsibility. And you're gonna mess up if you're really, really trying. There's things that we've tried in this church that fell flat. And I didn't blame, I went like, Shannon, man, why didn't you do an interpretive dance with that song, right? Like I was gonna, it was gonna hit. It was gonna hit if you just would have danced it out, right? No. There's been messages, there's been illustrations, that, there's been decisions I've made that, you know what, were dumb decisions. I've tried to limit them, but there's, and you know what, instead of, oh, Casey made me do it. <laughs> Casey keeps me from it most of the time. I had to own it. And if you're gonna get better, own your mess. Own your mistakes. Don't blame others, but here's the other thing. Don't give up, because here's what pride says. Well, I guess I'm just not good enough. No, none of us are. Doesn't mean you stop just because you failed. Well, I guess I'm just not talented enough. None of us are. Doesn't mean that you stop. That's pride speaking to you. Well, if you can't do it your way, then you don't need to do it at all. No, 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 no. That's a dumb way to live your life. Let's just talk that out. There's a better, a wiser way for you and I to live our life. Do you realize Thomas Edison invented 10,000 ways not to have a light bulb before he's ever successfully invented one? Right? He kept learning, not giving up. Bill Gates' first company failed miserably. It was called Trapo Data. None of you have heard of it, more than likely, because it failed, but he didn't give up. Milton Hershey started three candy companies that did not succeed before founding Hershey's Chocolate. Praise God that man didn't give up. <laughs> Einstein couldn't speak fluidly until age nine. In a commercial, Michael Jordan said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games 26 times. I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeeded. But my favorite story is about a woman that you and I probably have never heard about. Her name is Vesta Stout. Vesta worked in a factory in Illinois during World War II, and she inspected ammunition boxes and noticed a major flaw. The boxes at the time were sealed with paper with a pool tab, but the problem was the paper tab would get soaked and allow water into the container. This ruined the ammo, so the soldiers would dip the boxes in wax to keep them dry, but the problem with that was the wax made it much harder to access the ammo, which is more than an inconvenience when fumbling with an ammo box during an intense firefight, which could cost someone their life. Vesta had two sons in the military, and she knew plenty of other families with enlisted soldiers too, so she wanted them all to get what they needed for the fights they were in. She didn't just stay concerned, but she got busy. She had permission to create and innovate, so she dove into the immense task of trying to fix the problem she saw. She drew diagrams and made samples. She succeeded and she failed to fix the ammo boxes. When her work was complete, she prepared a presentation for her supervisors to get their support. She was convinced her invention would save many lives. Unfortunately, her boss thought it was a lousy idea. Her boss, a person who was insecure, didn't like change and didn't get it, but Vesta didn't take no for an answer when her idea wasn't well received and she wasn't going to wait for approval from someone else who didn't see her vision. She wanted her sons to have what they needed and refused to get knocked off course by the person who had authority over her job, but not her life. In the business world, it's a big deal if you go above your boss's head, especially when that boss has already shut the door in your face, amen? Well, Vesta didn't go to her boss's boss. She went to the president of the United States. That's my woman right there. Not my woman, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> she sent a letter to President Roosevelt that included her idea and a sample of her idea. Then she asked for approval to manufacture what she dreamed up so people could fight the fights they were in. Her idea was approved for immediate production. And get this, Vesta Stout's idea and work led to the invention of duct tape. I'm not kidding, right? <laughs> One woman refused to give up and didn't let pride or negativity hold her down. She made some bold moves to see it through. It didn't matter to her that others couldn't see, couldn't understand, didn't approve, or didn't see the need for the idea. She was focused on the possibilities. 
Man, there was mess ups, there was no's, there was criticisms along the way, but she didn't let pride, she didn't let offense get in the way, she kept on task. And some of you, you've let an offense and you've let pride get in the way and it's knocked you off task. But if you will humble yourself, right? If you will choose a life of humility, if you will listen to corrective and, and constructive criticism that brings correction to your life, here's, we'll go back to our first verse of the whole message. The promise is this, if you will listen, you will be home among the wise. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. I thank you for today, and I thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, I pray that this message today would be a message that we don't hear, but we apply. That we would not just be hearers of your word, but we would be doers of your word. And Lord, this is a message that we choose our way to. Lord, it's not this crazy emotional message. It's not this, oh, just this attractive, sexy message. But Lord, if we will apply your word to our life, it will bring amazing, life-changing results. Where we don't become our own worst enemy, we don't get our own in our own way because we're choosing offense. We're taking the bait of offense over and over again when you're just trying to direct our steps. And so, Lord, I pray today that we would take some tangible steps to live our life out in a wise way so that we can be home among the wise. If we will listen. That's the question. Are we listening to your word? Are we listening to you, Holy Spirit, speaking to us today and guiding our steps? Because, Lord, all of us need correction at some point in our life. None of us phase out. So, God, I pray for that person who got offended, that wants to give up today, that person that doesn't think they're enough and they want to give up today. Don't let them give up. But let pride die down. Let humility come in and take its place. And let us stay students of your will, of your purpose, and of your way so that we can be home among the wise. It's in Jesus' name I pray.